invite you to find the prophet Amos in the Old Testament already. We have reached our last uh, morning in Amos, our last sermon, Amos chapter 9, and you'll find that on page 770 in your church Bibles, the black Bibles, if you're using large print, 916, but the Bibles in front of you on the windowsills, uh, page 770. And let's hear the word of the Lord together through the prophet Amos. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and the Lord said, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake. Shatter them on the heads of all the people, and those who are left of them I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away, not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, it's like for us today saying the top of Everest, the highest known point in the world, from there I will search them out and take them. If they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, even there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. And if they go out into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. The Lord God of hosts, He who touches the earth, and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt. The Lord who builds His upper chambers in the heavens and founds His vault upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth, the Lord is His name. Are you not like the Cushites to me, the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? and the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Kir? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say, disaster shall not overtake or meet us. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen. May God bless to us His holy word. Let's Do you know that saying that uh, you hear quite often people say, I'll, I'll die a happy man if such and such, such and such ever happens. I'll die a happy man if Aberdeen ever win the league again. Something like that. You'll be waiting and waiting, won't you? Some of us have really noble things like that. I'll, I'll die a happy man or a happy woman when we end human trafficking child poverty. Beautiful aim for life, isn't it? Important goal, a worthy aim. Some of us have really big ones like that. Here's my one, okay? I have one like this. I will die a happy man if Trinity Church comes 
to know and love and believe the fact that Adam and Eve were not museum curators. That's what you're expecting, right, isn't it? That's your aim as well, isn't it? Christmas time, your aim in life. That's what you want before you die. Listen, friends, today it is the first Sunday of Advent. Christmas is coming soon. How wonderful for us today to have the last chapter of Amos on the first day of Advent. Because as Amos ends his prophecy, Amos wants to blow the doors off your Christmas 2021. He wants to to widen the lens, to increase the scale, whatever, whatever the phrase is, in a prophecy of judgment, and there is more judgment today. Here is good news beyond compare. Look at verse 11. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen. I will repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Friends, I want to take you forward this morning by taking you right back to the very beginning. That world that God made for Adam and Eve, friends, that world was not a dusty museum that Adam and Eve had to preserve for all time. Adam and Eve were not museum curators. We sometimes think that, don't we, that because God said to Adam and Eve, do not eat from this tree, and He he put them in the garden, we think He basically put them in this garden and said, don't touch anything. That's what you do with children when you take them to a museum, isn't it? Somewhere like that. Just, Just leave things as they are. They're so precious. Don't touch them. No, that that is not right, is it? God put Adam and Eve in the garden, but He gave them a mission, and their mission was to make the world like the garden. Isn't that right? Isn't that what they were told to do? Push back the boundaries of the garden until it covers the earth, fill the earth, subdue the earth, be fruitful, multiply. Adam and Eve were meant to be artists, not curators. The world was an art gallery, wasn't it? Full of beautiful white canvases waiting to be painted, waiting to be made like Eden. God put Adam and Eve as the mini artists in His his garden, made in the great artist's image. And Adam and Eve were meant to make more mini artists to fill the world with them. The world was meant to be full of them. Can you imagine, friends, what it would have been like if the whole world had been like that? The whole of humanity working in perfect harmony to push back the jungle, to turn the jungle into a garden and tending it and keeping it and ruling over it and delighting in it. And instead, what did Adam and Eve do in the garden? What did they do? Instead of painting on their first big blank canvas, well, they did what we all do. They, they took a selfie instead, didn't they? They they, they turned inwards. In in this world that God had given, look at me. Me first. We rule. It's like somebody going to the Louvre or to the Grand Canyon and standing in front of it, taking a selfie. They get home and show someone, and all you can see is them, not the great art, not the expanse. Friends, I want us to know today as we look at this final part of Amos that at Christmas time we remember the beginning of the end. We remember the beginning of the end of all that foolish rebellion in the garden. We remember instead the end for which God made the world, a world of beauty a whole earth full of God's glory and goodness. We remember that in the coming of Jesus into the world, God is taking what Adam and Eve were meant to do, and He is giving that mission to a new Adam, a new Adam, and saying, this time, this one, this man, this son, He will do it. He will do it. Oh, Christmas is the beginning of the end. It is the the promises made visible, made tangible, made touchable, that what God has said He will do, He will do. That's what Christmas is. 
So I want to show you that. I want to look at this. I'm sure you noticed as we read this, the change in tone at verse 11, that the passage falls into two halves. Verses 1 to 10, I want to show you the inescapable extent of God's judgment. The inescapable extent of God's judgment, verses 1 to 10. And then verses 11 to 15, the indestructible beauty of God's promise the indestructible beauty of God's promise. Let's look at the first one, the, the, the inescapable extent of God's judgment. Verses 1 to 10 are terrible, aren't they, again? He, here is a promise of real judgment at the hand of the Assyrian army that really happened. There was a day and time when all of verses 1 to 10 came true. Verses 1 to 10 of Amos sit there for us as a picture of what judgment is like. They are a picture of hell. Verses 11 to 15 are a picture of heaven. We tend to think about judgment, don't we, in those two names, two nouns, heaven and hell, two destinations that the world is always traveling towards. And it is true, those, those are the two ends two overall names given to the future reality for all of creation. But often the way that we think about hell and heaven lack the deep structures of the way the Bible portrays those things to us. It uses pictures. And Amos is a master at using poetry and images to, to paint the coming reality with depth and color and real feeling to make us want to run from one and to run towards the other. Hell and heaven are real, says Amos, yes, but look, they are like the destruction of a building versus the restoration of a building. They are like a people frantically fleeing for their lives versus a people laughing as they come home. Hell and heaven are like a ruined world versus a renewed world. And here in Amos, he, he puts these two contrasting pairs side by side, right touching each other to make a point. Verses 1 to 10, Amos wants us to know that the thing about judgment we need to know is that it is inescapable. It is inescapable. Judgment will come one day for everyone who has not run back to the gardener whose garden we've trashed. It's the only way to be safe, to run back to God, not, not away from God. And for everyone who spends their life pretending with God or avoiding God or running from God, there is only judgment. I want to show you three pictures in these first 10 verses. There, here, here are three things you need to know. Number one, when judgment comes, there is no protection in religion. When judgment comes, there is no protection in religion. Look at the opening words. I saw the Lord standing beside where? The altar. Where does this vision take place? In the temple. In the temple, I saw the Lord standing there beside the altar. And where does judgment fall? In the temple. And he said, strike the capital. Strike the, strike the top of the pillars so that the whole threshold shakes, so that there is an earthquake, so that it falls on the heads of all the people. Do you see it, friends? When judgment comes, there is no safety in religion. It's often what happened in wars, isn't it? Make it to the temple, make it to the cathedral, make it to the church, lock the doors, and there is international immunity and safety. No, says God, not here with me. Now, 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 what's happening here in verse 1 is, is this. It's very likely that verse 1 describes something that King Jeroboam had started doing in the north of Israel. So, King Jeroboam had led the ten tribes away from the south. He'd formed them into a new kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. He'd split, split God's people in half, split them in two. And in the north, away from the temple in the south, Jeroboam had set himself up as king and priest in a new temple, a pretend temple. He'd started his own new religious festivals. 
1 Kings chapter 12, 13, you can look it up. It's the background to chapter 9, verse 1 here. Jeroboam was a counterfeit priest at a counterfeit feast, presiding at a counterfeit altar, propping up a counterfeit monarchy. And it's as if in chapter 9, verse 1, it's as if in, in Amos's mind's eye, it's as if he sees the fake giving way to the real. He sees the pretend king standing at the pretend altar, and he realizes that standing behind that man is the Lord. Amos sees the fake giving way to the real. This is God's world, Jeroboam, not yours. The altar is God's, not yours to preside at. The temple is God's house, not your house. And God is angry when people use religion in the service of politics. That's what Amos is angry about, what God is angry about. God is angry when people use their religion to shelter the abuser, to protect the oppressor. That's been the message of the book all along, isn't it? God is angry when people use religion to inoculate themselves against God. Just enough religion to keep God on the shelf and at arm's length. Carols by candlelight once a year, yes, of course. But following the Lord Jesus in the way of the cross, not so much. And God is angry, Amos says. We need to be really clear here, friends. The judgment here in this chapter is not falling on all of God's people. Look at verse 8. Did you, did you catch that? I will destroy it, the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. Look at verse 9. I will save the house of Israel as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. In other words, those who are truly mine are not going to fall to the earth. God is saving His people in judgment. The people falling by the sword here, friends, these are the ones who rock up to church in their best clothes, in the big cars, but they have been laying off their staff for months, letting them go hungry. That's who Amos has in his sights here. It is the religious rich who despise justice. And friends, it is the people who use religion to make themselves comfortable instead of realizing that the point of it all was always to make the world a garden, to make the world beautiful. Oh, there is no protection in false religion. Number two, when judgment comes, there is no safety in flight. You notice how comprehensive that was? If they, if they dig into Sheol, if you go down, no, I'll reach them. Look at it again, verse 2. If they go up to heaven, if they go to the top, the highest mountain in the world, you notice each time, if they go there, I will, I will, I will find them. If they go down into the depths, even if they think they're safe going off into captivity. That's why you have this astonishing verses in 5 and 6, that the God who made the earth and who simply has to touch the earth, do you think God can't reach us and find us wherever we go to? No, you need to know, says Amos, there is no safety in flight. Number 3, verse 7, when judgment comes, there is no immunity in privilege. There is no immunity in privilege. Are you not like the Ethiopians, the Cushites to me, O people of Israel? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor, the Syrians from Kir? See, what Amos is saying here is he's saying, look, you and I know you Israelites. You, we are the people who have a special date in our calendar, don't we? We have a, a special date in our past that we look back to. And we think that date in our past grants us immunity. Is that what God is saying here? You are the people I redeemed from Egypt, aren't you? Of course you are. I brought you up. And God's people say, there it is, the Exodus. We're safe. We're safe. We have a big event in our past that has put us on God's side once and for all. It's what happens, isn't it? I was baptized 12th of May, 1973. 
I've got the certificate. Converted at camp on my 13th birthday. I was married in the West Kirk. I used to, I used to, used to, in the past. You see, you see what God is saying? L look, Israel, look, you are not the only nation whose migration I oversaw from one land to another. See, yeah, see, verse 7, did I not bring you up from the land of Egypt? Yes, I did. But did I not also move the Philistines from Kaphtor, the Syrians from Kir? Israel, the fact that I took you from Egypt to the promised land, that does not make you unique. I have done that with lots of nations all over the earth. No, what makes you special is that I took you from Egypt to Canaan to be mine, to, to know me, to love me, to, to obey you. That's what makes you special, to be like me. So where are you now loving your neighbor as yourself? That's what I want to see Amos has been saying all the way through. God is saying to his people, I haven't seen any of that for a long, long time. Yet, yet, yet you keep banging on about the exodus. There is no immunity in privilege. There is no protection in empty religion, no safety in flight, friends. At the end when judgment comes, Amos says, it will be inescapable in its extent. And I want to say, friends, rather than this being fearful, I want this the opposite. There is tremendous comfort here for us in all of this. And the reason there is tremendous comfort is look at the world around us, everything that is happening on the news, the, the greatest things that social media goes ballistic about, it is all about inequality, isn't it? And injustice. We hate inequality. Inequality makes us stand up in protest, doesn't it? I remember watching the film a few years ago, 12 Years a Slave. Some of you have seen that, haven't you? 12 years a slave. It's worth watching if you have a strong stomach. The, the portrayal of slavery in that film is so graphically violent that you want with every fiber of your being, you, you want to look away from the screen as you're watching it, you, you, and yet it makes you think that to look away would be morally wrong because you know what you are seeing happened and was so awful. We, we hate injustice, don't we? we? We want justice that reaches down to everyone, the rich and the powerful and the influential and the well-connected who can get the best lawyers and pull the right strings. No, we, we, we hate that. The color of skin or gender, when it automatically affects the emotional judgments a jury makes before a word has ever been spoken in court. We hate it. And friends, Amos is saying, in our fallen judgments in our world, our justice system rarely reaches far enough, rarely reaches true enough. We are so internally skewed, so societally controlled, so influenced. Justice is there, but it is imperfect. It is rarely the same for all, and Amos says that day will end. One day God's reach will be inescapable. All will be treated as they deserve. It will be inescapable in its extent. But friends, I want to finish with this. Isn't this wonderful to have this at the end? Verses 11 to 15. God's judgment will be inescapable in its extent, but number two, the indestructible beauty of God's promises, the indestructible beauty of what God said He wanted from the very start of time. He will see it through at the end. Hell at the end, you see, is a ruined world. It is, it is a collapsed temple. Hell is a fleeing people. Those are the pictures, aren't they? But what will heaven be like? Verse 11, heaven is a rebuilt world, a new temple. It is a feasting people. See, God is destroying the temple in verse 1. What's He doing in verse 11? Rebuilding it. 
restoring it. What did, David, what did God say to David, King David? Do you remember? Second Samuel, your throne will be established forever. Your offspring, David, his kingdom will have no end. His throne will rule forever. Oh, the indestructible beauty of God's promise. Here is Amos saying, yes, judgment is coming. Yes, it is real. But so too great David's greater son is coming. His promises are indestructibly beautiful. And look at the way they're beautiful, friends. Some of you get this immediately, verses 13. That they are all to do with food and harvest and bounty and plenty. Amos is saying the days are coming when this earth is going to yield a lavish, spontaneous abundance. You see the, 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 the beauty of verse 13. Those of you in the farming world, you know that the plowman and the reaper work at different times in the year, don't they? They don't ever work together. They're never in the field at the same time. You don't plow and reap together. Amos is saying, can you imagine a day when the sower of one crop will find the reaper of the last crop still at work because there is so much of it? You, you go out to sow and the, the farmer hasn't even finished harvesting the last crop. It's still there. You, you just can't gather it in. You know, friends, what heaven will be like, it will be like permanent harvest time. Isn't that amazing? Permanent harvest time. Behold, the days are coming when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of grapes will overtake him who sows the seed. You, you just will not stop pressing this stuff into vats, and drinking it and taking it in. See, often in the ancient world, a king would hold a great feast at a time when he wanted to make a special announcement, if there was a great royal wedding or some special occasion. And here it seems to be that God is doing that. He has an announcement to make to the world. He's going to do something, going to build David's house again. But before he does that, and as part of doing that, just take in what he is saying. At the end, friends, we will feast. We will feast there will be a banquet. There's, there's no shortcuts here, is there? If you look at verses 13 to 15, there's no cost-cutting, there's no Brexit problems and empty shelves and no problems with the supply chains. And that's what we like about banquets, isn't it? And feasts. You, you never go to a shortcut banquet, do you? Unless you're a student, I guess. Somebody says, you look, come, come over to my, my budget party easy party. We've really cut down this year. There's not much to table. Come on, come on, it'll be great. Come over. No, look what God is giving us. Verse 13, dripping sweet wine, gardens full of fruit. See, in the Bible, friends, God is a spender. God is a spender. He is a lavish spender, an extravagant host. God is a gardener the best of gardeners who, who sees his work teeming with fruit. We know this, don't we, that the theme of eating and banqueting runs all the way through the Bible. What was Eden meant to be? A garden to eat from, the most bountiful, beautiful, fruitful garden ever. There was only one tree they were not to touch, but everything else was theirs to eat. How's the promised land described? A land flowing with milk and honey and figs and grapes. They would hang from your trees and the vines by your house. Why? Because food means fellowship. Food means closeness. It means relationship. You, you know this in your own family, and Christmas time always exposes this, doesn't it? It is, it is not easy to eat with people you don't really like or, or who you're out of relationship with. It's kind of awkward. Food is fundamentally about sharing, isn't it? About giving and receiving and about closeness. The children in Sunday school, us in the evenings at Mark's Gospel, what, what has the Lord Jesus been doing in Mark's Gospel? Feeding people. He comes to preach, yes. He comes to heal, of course, and He comes to eat. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners, they asked. 
You know what one scholar has said that in Luke's gospel, if you open Luke's gospel and read it from start to end, in Luke's gospel, the Lord Jesus is always on his way to a meal or coming from a meal. And the reason, friends, for that is back here in Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Do you see what God is doing? He is rebuilding. He's saying that the ruined city that lies desolate and the entrance to every house that is barred, that, that's what happens in Amos. There are no entry signs all over this city of man. You cannot enter. You, you cannot enter. It's what happens in our world, isn't it? People are told all the time, you are not good enough, not strong enough, not rich enough, not clever enough, not qualified enough, not young enough, and door after door is closed. But in the city of God, it is the complete opposite. It is rebuilt and reopened. The gates to His city are wide open, and all may come, all may come in. You know, even if you have the biggest budget and you're the biggest spender, there's always a limit, isn't there? It's not unlimited. It's why I said, please sign up by Wednesday for Friday evening. The pizza is not unlimited, sadly. We, we need to know, is it 20, 30, 50? But look at the size of the dinner table, friends, in verse 12. Look at the size that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name all the nations. Even with the biggest heart, friends, isn't it true? With the biggest heart, there are always people you and I would struggle to invite. I th you know, I th you say, so, I think we should have so-and-so to your party, dear. And she says, mm, not, yeah, not so sure. We, we leave people out, don't we? Off to the side. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's because He is calling all the nations, all the nations to His throne. It's because the food He shares shows that the, the fellowship He brings breaks down barriers and rebuilds His house again. Jesus gives access to rebels. He eats with people who aren't doing the right thing at the right time and the right way. He came to love and rescue and save people who do not love Him. I read this a while ago. I thought these words were beautiful. We, you and me today, together today, we are the whores made brides. We are the thieves made saints. We are killers made apostles. We are foreigners made citizens. We are the hungry fed full. We are beggars made princes. We are the garden vandals restored to being the garden stewards and guardians of the most wonderful estate. Brothers and sisters, I want to be the very first today to wish you a very happy Christmas. No one's done it yet, I hope, to you. I want to wish you a wonderful, happy Christmas. For Christmas is the beginning of the end. It is the beginning of a world restored, a universe made new, for it is the arrival in our world of great David's greater son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's why we sang it together, the opening hymn, O come thou key of David. Maybe you didn't know what you were singing. Thou key of David. What do keys do? open doors. Come and open wide our heavenly home. Jesus opens the door to a new temple, a new Jerusalem. He leads the way to a new creation, and Jesus will lead you to a universe reborn. Amen.